Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to first series of Ikranet Esfahan Astronomy Meeting, which is organized by Esfahan University of Technology of Iran and International Center for Relativistic Astrophysics Network, Ikranet. I am talking to you from Isfahan, one of the world's most beautiful cities located in the center of Iran, which hosts this event. It is really a misfortune that we cannot host you here in Isfahan due to ongoing pandemic issue. However, this situation let us uh, to gather distinguished guests from all around the world. In this meeting, we are going to discuss about a broad range of topics from the ancient Persian astronomy to recent developments in theoretical and experimental physics, astrophysics, and general relativity. And I hope you enjoyed the meeting. So it is a great honor for us to start the meeting with the welcoming message of the distinguished Minister of Science, Research, and Technology of the Islamic Republic of Iran Professor Mohammad Ali Zolfigor. This message will be presented by prominent Iranian physicist, Professor Youssef Sobuti, who is a co-chair uh, uh, of the scientific committee of Ikranet uh, Isfahan Astronomy Meeting. And uh, I would like to mention that Professor Sobuti is the founder of the Institute for Advanced Study in Basic Science in Zanja. Professor Sobuti, can you hear me now? I do. Okay, great. I do hear so, you. So, so a stage is yours. Uh, please uh, go ahead. I will share your note and then uh, I think you can uh, continue. Let me just a few uh, seconds. Okay, but we cannot uh, see you, Professor Subuti. Can you please also uh, open your camera? I, I have, I have. I have opened my camera. But I cannot uh, see you, unfortunately. Let me see. There is a share button here. Let me oh, we can see you, Professor Subuti. Okay, great, great, great. Good. Maybe since I have shared my screen, I cannot uh, see him. Okay. So, should I, should I start? Yes, please. Should I begin? Okay. Good morning, good day, and good afternoon. I'm reading a message of the Distinguished Minister of Science, Research, and Technology of the Islamic Republic of Iran, His Excellency Professor Muhammad Ali Zulfi Gul, on the occasion of the Ikranet Esfahan Astronomy Meeting, which is being, which is just opened. In the name of the Most High, distinguished scholars and scientists, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, I feel proud and privileged to address the August gathering who have come together to recount some of the most intriguing and astonishing aspects of our universe within the framework of what we have come to call astronomy, from the ancient times to the present. It is therefore quite befitting that the Ikranet Isfahan Astronomy Meeting is being held in the ancient, beautiful, and historical city of Isfahan hosted by our colleagues at Isfahan University of Technology. We only regret that our distinguished guests are not here to be able to experience Isfahan in person. We at the Ministry of Science, Research and Technology consider the Ikranet Isfahan Astronomy Meeting a significant event and hope that it will mark the beginning of many research projects and collaborations, both here and abroad. My, my special thanks go to the Director of the International Center for Relativistic Astronomy, 
Astrophysics Network, Professor Ray Morufini, and his colleagues for converging on Isfahan. I trust that the Ikranet Isfahan Office of the IUT will become an active hub that would serve to establish lasting links between Iranian astronomers and their new partners in the whole network. The Ministry of Science, Research and Technology of Iran fully supports the scientific endeavors of the Ikranet and Iranian astronomers. I understand your scientific organizers have planned to have a glance at the history of ancient astronomy in Iran, as well as the modern one practiced in the Iranian universities and research centers. This is a very thoughtful provision and will allow you scholars to better assess the potentials of your colleagues here for more extensive collaborative works. And on a personal note, I assure you of the full support of the ministry in this respect. In fact, in the past decade, it has been a deliberate and publicly announced policy of the ministry to urge and support the universities administratively and financially to go international. I hope that your deliberations in this meeting will bear fruitful results leading to continued collaborations between Iran and Ikranet, and especially between Iran and Italy, a country with which we have had deep historical as well as historical ties well before its modern nationhood in mid 19th century, and with whose people we share many cultural commonalities. Finally, I'm certain that you will join me in hoping that the future Igranet Isfahan meetings will take place face to face so that in addition to the academic exchanges, our guests will be able to feast their eyes on the wonderful architecture of the monument of the numerous monuments of this wonderful city. Muhammad Ali Zulfi Gul, Minister of Science, Research and Technology of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you Dr. so much. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for, for presenting this insightful message and thank you so much for helping us to organize this event so uh, if you agree let's uh, continue the meeting with the welcoming message of the president of isfahan university of technology which will be uh, presented by professor Mohammad javad omidi acting president for international affairs and research developments of isfahan University of Technology. Professor Omidi, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, do you have my video and uh, voice? I think so. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we can see you now. And do you want me to give you access to share your screen? No, that's fine. Um, I can just go ahead and read, uh, just convey the message. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Um, can First Dr. Omidi open his camera, his webcam? Uh, is Professor Sabuti, his uh, camera is now open. Just uh, if you look at the screen, uh, you will see him. Okay. Uh, Professor Omidi, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to apologize uh, since Dr. Uh, Professor Abtehi is on traveling today, he asked me to convey his message. Um, so I begin. In the name of God, dear scholars and scientists, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, 
Good afternoon, good time. On behalf of Iswan University of Technology, it is my great pleasure to welcome and thank the eminent speakers and all the participants today for the three-day Ikranet Iswan Astronomy Meeting. I would like to sincerely thank the organizers of this event, the director of the International Center for Relativistic Astrophysics Network, Professor Remo Ruffini, and his colleagues, and also our colleagues at IUT Department of Physics. Astronomy is one of the earliest sciences in the world, and historical records of astronomical measurements date back to about 5,000 years ago. Centuries ago has been among the first countries developing this science. Ancient astronomy in Iran has created a solid ground for modern research work in Iranian universities and research centers. Iswan University of Technology, as one of the leading universities in Iran, was founded about 40 years ago. Today, IUT is ranked among the top Asian universities by international standards. IUT has 14 departments with about 11,000 students and 600 faculty members and offers Sir? four disciplines of engineering, basic sciences, agriculture, and natural resources. This one, University of Technology, was okay. the first Iranian institution that signed an agreement with Ikranet in 2016. Since then, we have enjoyed many collaborations such as exchanging students and faculty members. We have had several joint activities, including joint webinars on different astrophysical occasions. This one, University of Technology, participated actively in the last Marcel Grossman meeting which is one of the greatest meetings related to relativistic astrophysics, gravitation, and cosmology. IUT organized a parallel session on dark matter searches in that great meeting. Iranian scientists and IUT members have made remarkable contributions to this field of science with various publications in highly ranked scientific journals in the past. I hope Iran would become a member state of ICRANET in near future. We are interested in establishing joint degree programs with ICRANET member institutions and play a major role in Iran's academic realm and scientific activities in astrophysics in collaboration with ICRANET. Today, we are very proud to host ICRANET Isfahan astronomy meeting in the beautiful and historical city of Isfahan. We are hosting more than 32 invited speakers and participants from more than 16 countries. I hope that your debate and networking in these meetings will reach collaborations and create new opportunities for more joint activities between Iran and Ikranet. We will be proud to organize the future Ikranet Isfahan meeting series every three years in Isfahan University of Technology. We hope to see every one of you here in 2024 in person so that you would enjoy the magnificent beauties of the city of Isfahan. Once again, I appreciate your participation in this international event held by ICRANET and IUT, and I hope it will open up new ways for future scientific collaboration between our institutions. I sincerely hope you will enjoy today and the next two days of deliberations and networking. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you so much, Professor Omidi, for your message on behalf of the president of uh, Isfahan University of Technology. And uh, we, we see if also Professor Ruffini join us. Professor Ruffini, nice, nice to hear you and good morning. Good morning. It's a little earlier here in Italy, but uh, we are all here and we are ready to go. So, great. So, uh, let's, uh, if you agree, we can move and uh, I can a brief, uh, I can say something briefly about our meeting and uh, today, tomorrow, and the day after. Uh, this meeting co-organized by Ikranet and IUT and hopefully will provide a great opportunity for discussing about top different topics, ran ranging from ancient Persian astronomy to recent developments in observational astronomy, high-energy astrophysical phenomena such as gamma ray bursts, 
in short, uh, GRBs and active galactic nuclei, theories of gravity, general relativity, and its mathematical uh, foundations, black holes, dark matter, and early universe cosmology. Also, we will have a workshop on data science in astrophysics for young generation of astrophysicists that uh, will be held uh, during the meeting uh, in uh, tomorrow afternoon. So, for more information about these uh, events and the detailed and the abstract of the uh, presentations, please visit the Indico webpage in order to have more information and also uh, about uh, more information on this workshop. Also, we have a Slack channel in the meeting webpage, and that can be used to further discussion about the meeting topics between participants and speakers and to share essential announcement. So uh, we encourage you to join uh, to this uh, channel, both the speakers and participants, because you know, uh, during this virtual meeting, uh, this is an idea which we can have some social interaction around the meeting and you can ask some more uh, questions from the speakers and uh, that would be great to have more interactive meeting. And uh, the first session uh, will be started in less than 10 minutes and uh, Professor Rahwar is the chairman of the next session. The topic of the day is observational astrophysics, telescope, observational and theoretical high energy astrophysics, gamma ray bursts. And uh, today uh, uh, we, uh, we are so pleasured that we have different uh, speakers uh, from all around the world, from Italy, Iran, Australia, China, Chile, and even United States. You know, this. Uh, pandemic situation put some limitation on us, but it uh, makes easier to uh, collect together and have a great meeting. On behalf of organizing committee, I hope you enjoy the meeting and we hope to see you in person here in Esfahan in near future and in the next meeting. So, uh, I think we can uh, be prepared for the next session. Uh, Professor Rahwar, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I think I can, uh, I don't know can if, you? yes, uh, could, okay, great. So we can see you now. And uh, I think we can pass the, a stage to you if you want to say a few words and then uh, we will check with the speakers in advance to see if uh, they are here and they don't have any problem to start at the time. Okay, so Please. hello everybody and uh, uh, I hope that you have a good time during these three days and, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this event. Uh, very interesting to have uh, 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 speakers from all, the, all around the world uh, in this situation. So uh, let me introduce the first speaker. Uh, our first speaker in this session is Professor Yusuf Subuti. He will uh, talk about the, how the modern astronomy, astronomy was introduced to the Iranian universities. So uh, all the speakers have uh, 25 minutes plus five minutes for questions. So I think uh, we can start now, if you agree. We have a few minutes, but uh, 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 we can, I think uh, it's uh, up to you and uh, Professor Subuti. Uh, I will switch off my camera and then. We yes. can start in advance a little bit. We have five minutes. Okay. We can we can chat. Hello, sir Rob. How are you? I am fine. Thank you. <laughs> Remo, I I missed you seeing you. Here I, I am. The... Here I am. Oh, good. <laughs> you see me. What, morning. How are you? What time is in in Italy in Rome? Eight o'clock. Oh, 
five to eight. Yes, it is early, yes. Can I start, sir, up? Yes, sure. Or should I wait? I, I think we can start. Uh, okay. okay. We have, uh, we don't have any, I mean, plan. Okay. So, here you are. Okay. Uh, good morning again. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. What I shared with you today is an update to what I have done in 2006 in the IAU special session for astronomy in the developing world. In spite of our renowned pivotal role in the development of astronomy on the world scale during the 9th and 15th centuries, Iran's rekindled interest in modern astronomy is a recent happening. Since late 18th and 19th centuries, amateurs and philanthropists were promoting the modern astronomy by their writings and translations of astronomical literature. Small telescopes were available for watching the sky, if not for any scientifically planned project. The University of Tehran is established in 1935. Celestial mechanics was taught in its mathematics department. Solar physics and special relativity were the regular courses in the physics department. I myself learned the basics of the special theory of relativity in our classical mechanics course and the rudiments of the Riemannian geometry and curved space times in my math physics courses. A breakthrough in the introduction of solar physics to the Iranian society came with the occasion with the creation of the Geophysics Institute of the University of Tehran in 1950s. A modest solar tele telescope a modest solar observatory equipped with a small solar telescope and appropriate hydrogen, IR, and UV filters was established. The late Dr. Elinush Terian, a gracious Iranian-Armenian lady, was in charge of the operation of the observatory. In late 1950, with the sponsorship of Shi Afshar, director of the Geophysics Institute, Iran became a member of the International Astronomical Union. In the early years, Dr. Terian was representing Iran in IAU. Serious attempts to introduce astronomy into university curricula and to develop it into a respectable and worthwhile field of research began in mid-1960s. The pioneer was Shiraz University, which should, should be credited for its first few dozen of astronomy and astrophysics related research papers in international journals, for training the first half of a dozen of professional astronomers, and for creating the Biruni Observatory. The Biruni Observatory is the same as El Biruni that uh, uh, is in the Western literature is known. Here, I take the opportunity to acknowledge the valuable advice of Bob Cook and Ed Guinan, then at the University of Pennsylvania in the course of the establishment of this observatory. Biruni Observatory celebrated its 40th anniversary in 2017. It is renovated under the directorship of Dr. Muin Musleh, Presently, Biruni Observatory is the only operating 
Astronomical Observatory in the country. At present, the astronomical community of Iran, including cosmologists, consists of about 550 professionals, roughly half university faculty members and half MSc and PhD students. According to the Web of Science, scientific contributions of its members in 2020 exceeded 4,500 papers in reputable international journals. This is slightly lower than 1% of the scientific contributions of the whole Iran, around 48,000 in 2021, in 2020. Among the existing observational facilities, Biruni Observatory, with its 51 centimeter Cassegrain OCD cameras, photometers, and other smaller educational telescopes is by far the most active place. A number of smaller observing facilities exist in Tabriz, Mashhad, Isfahan, Zanjan, Tehran, Babul, and other places. In addition to the optical, optical observatory, the first cosmic ray observatory was established by Jalal Samimi in the 80s in the Sharif University of Technology. The observatory is working based on plastic scintillators and Shrinkov radiation. More than 10 PhD students finished their thesis working with the same instrumentation. Recently, the University of Semnon also developed its own astroparticle detectors. The cosmology group of Sharif University of Technology is an internationally recognized research team by now. Initiated by Reza Mansouri and followed by his students, the group presently works mainly on structure formation and early universes. Also, since 2008, Sohrab Rahwar, whom you are seeing his photograph in this session, and his students are collaborating with an international observational project on exoplanet detections. In the past 20 years, astronomers of Iran have staged an intensive campaign to have an Iranian national observatory of, it, of their own. The initial planning was for a two meter class telescope with CCD based instrumentation. Thanks to Riza Mansouri, the plan was updated to 3.4 meter Cassegrain. We hope to have its first light in about 10 minutes time. And I believe Dr. Khosrow Shahi uh, will report on it. The president director of the Iran National Observatory is Habib Khosrow Shahi, a PhD from ISPS Sanjan. The site selection for INO was done by an international team of advisors and a team of 15 experts from the Institute for Advanced Studies in Basic Sciences. This was headed by Professor Nasiri a PhD of Shiraz University, and presently the Chancellor of Shahid Beishti University. The Astronomical Society of Iran, though some 45 years old, has expanded and institutionalized its activities since 1990s. Astronomical Society of Iran sets up seasonal schools for novices, organizes annual colloquia and seminars for professionals, 
and supports a huge body of amateur astronomy from among high schools and university students. Over 30 of 420 ASI members are also members of IAU and take active part in its events. Last but not the least, Nujum, the Farsi word for astronomy, is the only astronomical monthly magazine of the Middle East. Nujum is founded by Reza Mansouri and a team of Nujum lovers from among his circle. Nujum celebrated its 13th anniversary in the spring of in the spring 2020. Uh, my message uh, is completed. However, I kindly request my colleagues in Iranian universities and research centers to provide me with any information that they think I have missed to include in this report, and I will uh, include them in the final edition of this short report that I presented to you. Thank you very much. I am ready for questions and answers. Dr. Ahwar. Thanks so much, Professor Subuti. Uh, excellent uh, report on uh, uh, It's not an excellent report. It's a very uh, short one. And I think that I have missed many activities around the country. And I kindly, I request my colleagues in different places in the country to let me know whatever I have missed and I will include in the final version of this message. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there's any question, please. You can, I think everybody can open the microphone or can type in the chat box. Any questions? So now we have 70 participants here, I think. Okay, I I don't see any question. Maybe I will ask a quick quick question. Yes, please go ahead. I just I just wanted to know whether we can get the PDF version of this uh, nice uh, historical talk. Uh, I I think Dr. Shakri okay. um, will include it in the final report, and yes, it will be available for everyone. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah, this is Amir Abadati. Uh, with respect to your um, experience in Iranian Astronomical uh, Society, Professor Sabuti, I have, I mean, I have heard this a lot that Iranian astronomers are a lot, uh, you know, likely and they really like to work on theoretical uh, astronomy and astrophysics. They are not interested in um, observational astronomy. Do you think that's just because um, the lack of instruments in Iran or it's just something that people in Iran like to do? I mean, maybe some, somewhere in our education, there is something missing. What do you think about that? Thank you. Uh, what you're saying has been the case so far but it is not because of the uh, inclination of the Iranian researchers to go theoretical and not to pay attention to observations. It is the lack of observation facilities. As I said, the only uh, observing facility at present since, since 1960s up to present 
is the 51 centimeter cassie grain of the Biruni Observatory. Uh, Tabriz tried to establish uh, an, its own observatory and had a 60 centimeters uh, cassie grain, but uh, somehow they couldn't manage to put it into operation because the site was too far away uh, from Tabriz and unreachable. Or Mashhad University at the times had small observing facilities, but not uh, large enough uh, to produce uh, to produce uh, significant results to be presentable in uh, interna to internationally. Uh, however, uh, we will hear from Dr. Hosri Shahi on uh, Iran National Observatory, equipped with 3.4 meter telescope, fully automatic and uh, well thought. In 10 months time, uh, uh, as, I, as, as I know. And if that telescope comes into operation, uh, it will be a very good opportunity to do respectable and significant and noticeable observational work presentable anywhere in the world and enlarging participation in observational astronomy. Let us wait to hear Dr. Hosro Shahi's report and see what should be expecting. Good. Is there any question? You still have 19 minutes to 11, which is my time. <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> may, I, may I add one comment? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah, maybe actually it's a good time to announce that hopefully in, in less than a week, actually in November 9, with the 11th anniversary of the Dr. Alunesh Terian, we are going to establish the female branch of the Astronomy Society of Iran to promote the astronomy activities of the female astronomers in Iran, including, of course, the academic one and also the amateur ones. And we hope that this branch helps the women who are interested in astronomy to have courage to, to do their interest in astronomy. Thank you. Who are you talking? Can you say his, your uh, name? This is N.C. Erfani from ISPS. N.C. Erfani. Okay, okay, okay. Next room to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I made a deliberate uh, mention of Ali Nushterian, who, has passed, who passed away a few years ago. And he was a... a, a, a he, he, she was female and uh, she was an astronomer and uh, she was in charge of the solar telescope of Geophysics Institute and also represented the Iran in IAU for years and uh, I myself met her in in uh, Czechoslovakia IAU meeting in Prague in in mid 1960s it's a very good suggestion uh, and to uh, to establish this female branch of iranian astronomers nowadays females are conquering all the <laughs> all sangars <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Yeah, that, that's why we realized that now it's the time for, for give a floor and also chance for female scientists to, to continue their career in astronomy. And I'm sure that in the near future, they will have a really great uh, role in the astronomy of the year. I will give you all chances that I have to you to expand on what you're th thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Uh, very good. Uh, uh, sorry, may uh, may I add one point? 
Yes. Can you, can you hear me? So, uh, actually, uh, Professor Subuti asked me to provide uh, something about uh, Professor Kiasatpur. And oh, yes, Professor, yes, yes, yes. Yes, Professor Kiasatpur was one of the leader in astronomy in, in Isfahan, and actually he did uh, the great job to develop uh, the, the astronomy in Isfahan University, and uh, we have uh, we have his commemoration in a few weeks. And uh, you know, just I wanted to mention this, and and of course I will provide some uh, some material with our friend in Isfahan to to complete your notes to also add that and. Thank uh, you very I much. Would like to and if you want to to add something, uh, because uh, mm -hmm. just I wanted to mention this. Uh, yes, uh, you also have the Adib Society of uh, Amateur Astronomers in Isfahan, and I think they deserve uh, a, a, a publicity. Please mention that. Give me a, give me a yeah. short note to include this. Thank you. I will provide it for you. Could I ask a question? Please. Yes, please. Uh, Say your name, please. This is this is Mohammed Kolachi from IAS. Yes. Okay. Um, Professor Subuti, I was wondering if you are going to join any research on um, radio astronomy in future. Uh, I'm afraid radio astronomy, uh, 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 one of my students from Shiraz who went to Ahwaz, he tried to uh, create some radio astronomy facilities. Uh, I have no, no recent news from him. And also the Anjan University initiated by Dr. Nasidi, they had attempts to set up some uh, antennas and so on. But to the best of my knowledge, radio astronomy is not, is not expanded, uh, extended in Iranian, among the Iranian astronomers. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Subati, we have uh, three minutes uh, time to start Professor Rufini's talk. I think uh, if I just want to want to mention the time. So if there is a question, just a brief question, please. Okay, I think there is no question. Okay, let's thank at, again. At one, uh, the, the, sorry, Rob. At one time, at uh, Tabrizis uh, were very good in astronomy. There were few astronomers in Tabriz. And I asked our Tabrizi friends to have a short report on what what the present status of their doing is to be included in my report. Okay. And um, also the same of, of Meshat, Meshat University. And I think Dr. Rabbasi will report on Meshat's uh, astronomers meetings. Okay. I think doc, uh, Dr. Jasser is not here, but I can send email to him just to send a report to you. Jasur and also the, the Dr. Yeah. Rajab Shiri. Yes. Hello. Do you have my words? Yes. Yes, we do. This is Mahdi Nasr Lozada. I'm from Tabriz University. I heard you're talking about uh, Dr. Jasur and Rajab Shiri. Yes. Um, I just wanted to conclude that. Uh, we had few uh, projects uh, on astronomy and uh, the history of astronomy in Iran, but due to pandemic, um, they were canceled. 
Uh, I if can you also are, give. Uh, yeah. Please. If you are from uh, at Tabriz Astronomy Group, please ask your colleagues to send me a short report to be included uh, in in uh, what I presented to 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 you here. Uh, I myself can do that. Uh, you okay, fine. You do it. Yes. Very nice of you. Very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, let's thank again uh, Professor Subuti for his, for his talk. And uh, uh, let's go to the next speaker. Uh, our next, next speaker is Professor Romeo Ruffini from Italy. And he's going to talk about uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of introducing the black hole. Uh, Professor Ruffini, yes? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. have you. First of all, I always remember with great pleasure my first visit to Iran and visiting the Biruni Observatory created by Professor Bob Koch and Ed Ginan of the University of Pennsylvania at the University of Shiraz was uh, a, be a beautiful location on the mountain overlooking the beautiful town of Shiraz. And of course, since then, I had the pleasure to continue my interaction with um, Youssef at the uh, Zanjiang Institute for Advanced Study on Basic Sciences and visit them and other universities recently and admire the beauty of that uh, center. It has uh, the serenity of, uh, in, like the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the possibility to enter a library day and night and uh, open to everyone and this uh, beautiful, beautiful example uh, on planet Earth. The collaboration also with Iran goes on very actively, in addition of having in Ikhanet uh, uh, adjunct professor Sorouj, uh, also we have a full professor, Raim Moradi, and we keep having visiting visitor continuously from uh, for a short period, but uh, from many of the universities on which we have collaboration agreement. A novelty is even we have two new graduate students from Iran. The most recent just arrived from the University of Mazandaran. Well, uh, I'm extremely happy uh, to uh, thank everybody, Sorush, the University of Isfahan, and uh, Professor Suputi to have prepared such uh, a, a, a remarkable program which uh, uh, initiates um, the celebration of the 50th anniversary of uh, the introduction of the black hole. The key message is that after 50 years, we finally observe the black holes and we can really assert what my dream was 50 years ago, that black holes are alive and we'll see their action, their emission in uh, X-ray, in gamma ray, in TEV radiation and uh, all over uh, the spectrum and we are learning fundamental science which was unable, we were unable to learn before on the planet Earth. But uh, let's go by step, step. Of course, the pioneering work in uh, in this kind of astrophysics started in China when uh, 
the program of looking from, for the guest stars in our universe started and they had the first evidence of uh, a supernova on which they gave with the Japanese and the Korean astronomer. The Chinese gave the detailed description of the 1054 super, su, uh, supernova. And then later on, the observation of the, of the universe continue, continue um, in, uh, uh, in Samarkand with the Uluk bag. And we will hear some lectures about uh, the role of Uluk bag uh, in uh, medieval science. But that was not a very, very important point. But now the situation is exponentially growing. And I appreciate the point of Youssef, how important our observation. Yes, they are essential. But let me tell you that also essential are not only the observation, but also the theoretical work on Einstein theory. And the best example is the paper by Roy Kerr in 1963, a two pages his rev letter, which was published by Roy. Two pages, the gravitational field of a spinning mass as an example of algebraical spatial matrix. Pure mathematics. But that was the starting point to find this solution out of the Einstein equation and representing a rotating object precisely described by an analytic solution by this masterpiece of Roy. And I am very proud and happy that Roy Kerr will speak to all of us tomorrow from New Zealand uh, in celebration of that. But this Kerr solution was really the starting point. And um, in 1968, Brandon Carter managed to solve the hamilton jacobi equation of the Kerr solution and I'm sure that Youssef remembers this uh, beautiful work which was summarized by, Bran, uh, by Landau uh, Lifchitz's book by Evgeny Lifchitz. And uh, at the same time, in 1968, John Wheeler and myself solved the solution of the Carter equation um, the hamilton jacobi equation, and uh, given a, a way to evaluate the orbit for the first time around a Kerr black hole. And it was there that we learned about the last stable orbit, which later on were called the ISCO. And everything, again, can be summarized in few pages. One two pages for the Kerr solution and a few pages in landau Lifkitz on the work of Carter and Johnny and myself. Following 69, in 70, and then later on in 71, there was the coming to Princeton of a, a very unique a Greek student, Dimitris Christodoulou, who came from uh, Greece, introduced by Papa Plato, at the age of, um, of uh, 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 16. He was admitted by request of John Wheeler to, uh, to the university. In one year, he passed the undergraduate. And then uh, in, uh, in another year, he passed the general. And then he was my first student, and I gave him a solution. Uh, Dimitrius uh, 
was incredibly strong in creating mathematics and uh, solutions. And one, one night, I uh, gave him uh, equation to integrate, and, uh, and, um, and he, he came up the morning after with the solution of this equation and the introduction of the, which we did, uh, in, of the reduced thermal mass of the, of the black hole. This, were, this was just the year before that uh, in 71, we introduced with John Wheeler, using also Dimitri's work, the, the basic idea of a new physical object, not a mathematical solution, thanks to a mathema the mathematical solution, which was given by Roy, but to introduce a physical object characterized by mass, spin, and angular momentum. And with Johnny, who is here on the right side of this picture, I am in the middle uh, of the picture. Tullio Regge is reading here a book, and some of the other group in Princeton are present. We introduce finally the concept of black hole, a new physical object. And uh, in 1971, we introduced the mass formula of the, the mass formula of the black hole and was really a race, uh, a race because uh, with Christodoulou. On uh, November of 71, you can find in Fidrev the uh, Christodoulou Ruffini mass formula, and uh, uh, based on Kerr. And then uh, uh, one week later, the same identical formula, but derived from different conceptual, from different conceptual uh, uh, derivation, one week later was introduced by, Steve, by Stephen Hawking. Year passed, and in 2017, Roy Kerr got uh, an award from the Swedish Academy. Here you see Roy in, in uh, the pro, uh, pro, Professor Ruffini, can you hear me? Uh, unfortunately, we cannot see your presentation. Do you showing us something? Are yes. you showing us? We are, we are showing. I'm showing. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, you must give me the permission to share the screen. Are you there? Ok, sei stato scelto come relatore, ok, condividi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. And you have, can... we have your, your screen. You, you see the picture? Ok, we can see your, the picture on the screen, yes. Yes, but unfortunately, we didn't see the previous okay. thing. Okay, this is easy. Roy Kerr is the paper in, in, uh, in Fisrev Letter 1963. Please take uh, note. Two pages paper. Then this paper, this from Landau Lifchitz, which uh, you can uh, find in all the library. And uh, the 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 uh, the contribution of Brandon Carter to inter integrate in the equation to integrate the equation of uh, 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 on the metric of the Hamilton Jacobi equation in uh, the Kerr solution and then st still in the in Landau Lifchitz the the work of uh, the orbit uh, of uh, John Wheeler and myself. This you can find in the volume two of Landau Lifchitz. 
And then uh, the fantastic paper again, two pages uh, of Dimitris Christodoulou, one with the basic equation for the mass of the black hole as a function of the reducible mass, and then uh, the concept of ergosphere of the black hole in the same paper uh, uh, given on the right side here by Johnny and myself. The possibility that you could extract energy from the black hole was only an idea for an idea at the time. But the formula of the mass, of the reducible mass, uh, became soon a reality. And, um, and therefore, on that ground, in Princeton in 1971, In 1971, in Princeton, here is the picture of John, myself, and a little younger, John and John Wheeler, on the on the right side, and um, and the moment in which we introduce uh, the concept of Lacan, this uh, totally new concept, and this picture was done by artists of the New York. A planetarium, but the text was written with passion and uh, a lot of uh, beautiful um, uh, diagrams by uh, Johnny and myself. But the, the key formula was obtained in 1971 by Christodoulou and myself. And uh, that formula um, uh, is the formula of the black hole, which was uh, uh, including the mass, the charge, the angular momentum. And uh, uh, here we have celebrated this uh, uh, writing of the formula because we obtained in November 71, and one week later, starting from a completely different derivation, not the solution, the effective potential of Landau-Lifchitz, which we followed, the, uh, the, the work we did with, uh, with Wheeler before, but uh, from a different point of view, from the mathematical aspect of the Kerr solution, the same formula, mass formula, was obtained one week later, by uh, uh, Stephen Hawking. The occasion to celebrate this was after the meeting we had in, uh, uh, after the meeting that uh, uh, Roy Kerr got the award from the Swedish Academy, we went to Cambridge and <coughs> still remember, we tried to see Roy, um, uh, with, with Roy, we tried to see Hawking and they said, no, no, you cannot see him, he's in the hospital. The hospital is not people. And then uh, we were really deceived. We went uh, to the building where Hawking used to stay. And with great surprise, the secretary came and said, Professor Hawking, I would like to see you. And we had a fantastic three days. First, a lot of discussion. Second, uh, at the end of the discussion, Stephen asked, but Remo, can you give a seminar? Of course I do. Therefore, we did a seminar the day after. And then something exceptional happened. And then after the seminar, Stephen said, but what about tomorrow? Can we have dinner? Yes, this is the picture of the dinner at home of Stephen, which was by far one of the best dinner I ever had. Well, so much for this picture. Okay, I, uh, I have to rush now. I think one, uh, one, Angora, one of the greatest uh, happening uh, which uh, started everything was the implementation by United States of uh, the non-proliferation 
agreement uh, verification by the Vila satellite. The Vila satellite were put in orbit and um, uh, looking in X-ray and gamma rays. And uh, after uh, two or three years of observation, they noticed that there were signal coming out which a characteristic time of few seconds in X-ray and gamma rays, which uh, were not clear where they were coming from. The reason of, uh, they were not clear if they were coming from the Earth, they come from the Moon, some, some and the big mystery started. We, um, at a meeting in San Francisco, in, which we published in the book with Gursky uh, in 1974, and the mystery started. What is going on somewhere on the earth? Maybe some technical aspect, who knows? Uh, from this signal, the only thing which was clear is that in average they were coming once a day. The history, <clears throat> but was very interesting that already in that meeting in 1974, with a student, a collaborator from France, Thibaut D'Amour, we proposed without any, any evidence that uh, this uh, burst, this gamma ray burst, were coming from black holes. We published this paper in Fisrev Letter, and uh, we predicted that if a black hole was originating this object, it meant that the energy of this gamma ray burst should be of the order of 10 to the 54 Earth. The paper was published, but had no very big feedback because there was no observational evidence for this. And even the theory which we proposed was based on a Kern Newman solution with a charge. And all the collaborators around the world asked, but how you can have a charged object in the sky? I always, I always uh, answer, no, don't worry. Uh, if there is a charge, a big charge, then we can learn the physics of this object and predict the origin of uh, the gamma ray and the X-ray, which were observed by GRB, was a promise. And to people criticizing, no, but uh, you have to explain the chart. Yes, you can explain the data, but it's not enough. You must observe. OK, on this topic, it took 50 years. And only two years ago, we were able, and I will show you very quickly, the solution of this enigma in the conceptual world, what is it, why you can speak of a charge in, uh, a, in an object uh, but, uh, of, uh, of astrophysics, but it's not a charge, it's an effective charge. But uh, let's go step by step. Okay, the discovery came from the Villa satellite. And uh, and uh, and uh, which you find here on the on the right side, on the left side, and then a big um, a telescope, see uh, the Compton telescope, was launched. One of the largest uh, X-ray gamma ray telescope ever, thirty meter long, was sent up by NASA. And uh, they could map for the first time the origin, the direction in which the cosmic, the gamma ray bursts were coming from. But uh, the angular resolution 
was not enough to identify the source of the gamma ray burst. And therefore, the only important, uh, very fundamental um, data from the uh, uh, Compton gamma ray telescope was that uh, gamma ray bursts were democratic. They were coming from all over the direction in the universe without any preference. They were homogeneously distributed. An incredible message. Are they really something very close to us, very closer than the, than the Milky Way that you see from Isfahan during the night, but they should have had the signature of the Milky Way. But there was no signature of the Milky Way. Therefore, either they have to be very local or much more grandiose, they should have come from the entire universe, homogeneously distributed. The solution of the mystery came from this small telescope launched by Italy, by the Pepo Sachs uh, telescope. Yesterday, I was uh, in Bremen with the, with the honor of uh, uh, the, the industry, the German industry, which created the uh, with an Italian, the, the, the German Institute, uh, DHL, uh, which uh, had an Italian uh, factory uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, group of aerospace were the one to create the mirrors which allow the x-ray mirrors which allow to focus and to find out where the x-ray were coming from and this was an epochal a small telescope relatively small but changed the physics and the astrophysics completely they, uh, Beposax is the name of the satellite, was, were, was able to localize what much more accurately the position in the sky of the gamma ray burst. And the race started immediately since we knew the position very, very uh, much better than before, we could identify the location of the X and gamma ray source with great precision. The afterglow allowed to do that, these lines over here. And, this, and the, 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 once we knew the position, the rays started in uh, the uh, radio telescope, and I hope very much Iran will enter this very, very important field now that uh, uh, great collaboration is being developed uh, all over the world in the radio. And uh, at the same time, the optical telescope had developed, thanks to Riccardo Giacconi, the VLT of ESA, of ESO in, in Chile. Here is the I, uh, on, the left, on the right side, and of course, the beautiful Manuakea Tech telescope uh, that allowed to find the light coming from this uh, GRB source, and the message was very clear. The object were thousand billion light years away thousand billions light years away of the order of and what it implies that this object which were appearing as a bomb explosion on the earth were really explosion of 10 to the 54 world for the student what means 10 to the 54 world if you take our sun 
de Sam sen energy of 10 to the 33. How many galaxies there are in the Milky Way? Well, when you look at the poster of Isfahan, there you see the Milky Way. They are of the order of 100 billion of stars. So for this means that if you take all the stars of the galaxy, they will reach an energy of 10 to the 45. Uh, we are still short of 10 to the 9 to reach 10 to the 54. And the message was grandiose, was that they exist. 10 to the 9 Milky Way object in the universe. And therefore, this gamma ray burst, when it, it appears for a few seconds as the energy of all the star of the universe. Uh, Professor Ruffini, I'm sorry, but uh, we have, uh, we are going to finish the time. If okay, I... let me go fast. Now we, you will hear during the, you will hear during my, the, the during the meeting, uh, what is the origin of this uh, uh, gamma ray burst? It's a binary system which uh, goes through evolution and a binary system goes through evolution and uh, the, there is a first supernova and then there is a second supernova and then uh, there is this supernova expanding and accreting on the star which originated the, uh, from the supernova and the companion object and this is all the physics uh, which we are uh, understood and that we will present uh, uh, during the meeting. Of course, uh, this was made possible, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Youssef was mentioning, thanks to the fantastic satellites which were put into orbit, the Fermi satellites, the uh, VLBI, uh, um, the, the very large telescope uh, developed by ESO, thanks to Ricardo Giacconi, and then, uh, of course, the SWIFT satellite, the Niels Gerrel SWIFT satellite. And what is new since uh, a, a, a few years, also, and uh, this is something that I, I know. Um, the, the uh, 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 Iran is working on the Cherkov satellites um, uh, on Sharif University. The, the, the big Cherkov satellites, which have allowed to receive the TEV radiation uh, from the GRB. And of course, there is uh, a lot of interest uh, from China uh, to, uh, on this race. Well, uh, what can I tell you? Well, this uh, is the first GRB we really understood in all detail. The spectrum, uh, the supernova rise. You will hear this uh, in, the next, uh, in the next talk. And also in the next talk, you will hear about uh, the machine, which we finally understood in 2019, which is at the basis of uh, the extraction of energy, why is so important the Kerr solution? Because the Kerr solution, and this is a diagram you will hear, as a is an addition, it's not in a vacuum, but uh, in presence of a very thin uh, plasma, uh, completely um, uh, ionized and with a magnetic field, is the whole solution. And for the first time, we understand the physics of this world solution, which has this uh, effective charge of, of uh, which is given by, by this equation. Uh, without being too long, you will hear about the black hole quantum, because this gamma ray burst emits not continuously, but on very short time scale. 
and uh, we understand all the details. We have also a new physics, completely new physics, which we just published on the 25th of uh, September in uh, FISREV with uh, Raim Moradi. There is a new physics which is very fundamental and uh, we could not see before inside our planet Earth, which is characterizing this emission. You will hear more on this, but uh, let me, this is the, the machine that Professor Rueda will be, will be describing with Wang Yu and uh, with Raim. And uh, let me show you, uh, I spoke about the black hole being alive. Yes, the black hole is alive. And uh, it emits uh, in 10 minus 14 seconds uh, a black hole like in a GRB. But if the black hole is much bigger, bigger, what I mean, 100, million, 100 billion uh, solar masses, 10 to the 9 solar masses, 10, uh, 10 yes. Um, 10 to the 10 times 10 to the 9 solar masses, like in M87, then the emission occurs not in very, very short time, but every half an hour. Here we see the black hole alive in M87 emitting X ray, gamma ray, and this is one of the greatest results which have been obtained. Uh, in, in recent, uh, therefore we understand more. ESA is planning to send up uh, a new satellite, and uh, but everything is based. Let's go back to a solution. Yes, this experiment is essential. We cannot know black holes without all the satellite, and I hope very much that uh, your. Uh, uh, telescope will be soon uh, operative with the 3-meter because you could follow the afterglow of GRB in real time, every day, one. But what is much more essential is uh, the, the participation with the mathematician, uh, like uh, Christodoulou and uh, Roy Kerr, and I am very, very hope very much that the presence of care will motivate the development, both its observation in Iran, but also of fundamental science in which mathematics and uh, you have some of the greatest and most important uh, uh, result. Pam Dirac said the new cosmo cosmology will probably turn out, turn out to be philosophically even more revolutionary than relativity and quantum theory. Yes, we are in this era. A, re, a absolute new science is coming out from the calls. And we have the opportunity to develop observation and theory at the same time and learn more about this fantastic universe following Einstein equations. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Ruffini. Very excellent talk. Uh, let's ask the uh, audience to have, uh, we have uh, just for f few sec few seconds, I mean, we have uh, two minutes for questions. If you have a quick, Sorry. short questions, please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, may I please ask you a question? Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for this conference. Uh, I am very interested in one of Dr. Ruffini's and his team's uh, recent papers that stated dark matter might be responsible for the gravitation in our galaxy instead of a supermassive black hole. Uh, how about the observation? Uh, how about observation uh, proofs for this uh, theory? <laughs> well, uh, we will hear uh, some of the presentation during the, the meeting. Actually, we have published three papers. 
And uh, yesterday, <coughs> the, the referee report, very positive, came from monthly notice yesterday morning, but with the three pages of uh, questions, he said, we would be really very happy if you could answer all these questions. Uh, therefore, please wait for uh, at least a few days that we will answer to that. And uh, from, the, uh, from the theory point of view, it's one of the most exciting topic. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, at least one presentation. It's a new, new matter, a different form of matter. It acts uh, 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 gravitationally like all the other matter, but it's different. We think that it's a new particle of uh, filthy curve, which characterize both uh, the, the, the center of the galaxy and, uh, uh, and the large black holes of 10 to the 9 solar mass by collapse of dark matter. In other words, in this dark matter in the center of the galaxy is too small to collapse. But if, it up, if it's bigger in mass, then it creates a black hole. In the center of our galaxy, there is no yet evidence for uh, the discovery of a black hole. Uh, the experiment uh, um, is uh, very difficult. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, they are developing new instrument in US, uh, in ESO. Uh, we expect more detailed data, but uh, uh, the beauty is that there is no black hole trivially. We have still the two theory possible, the one of the dark matter and the black hole, but the black hole cannot be care black hole. If it's a black hole, it's a Schwarzschild black hole, not active. Therefore, the race now in the next, uh, in the next year or two is, is either to be a Schwarzschild black hole or to be a dark matter black hole. If it's a dark, if it's a shot, okay, we will not, there is nothing specially new from a Schwarzschild solution. But if there is a new physics, a new particle, which can explain also the center of the galaxy, active center of the galaxy, that is extremely, extremely important. That is a way that science make progress. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think we can uh, start the next uh, talk. If you have more questions, there is a facilities. Uh, I think there is a link they, they sent to us that uh, the people can talk to each other during the break time or any time later and ask more questions and discuss about the topics. So uh, thank you again, Professor Ruffini, for your interesting talk. Um, so our next speaker is Professor Habib Khosrowshahi from uh, from IPM and the uh, Iranian National Observatory, and we will talk about the uh, and and update us about this uh, telescope and observatory. So, Professor okay. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Good morning. Uh, do you hear me well? <clears throat> yes. Okay. And do you have my slides as well? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, well, good morning, everyone, or good day, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, Sorry, to be here. Sorry, have your camera, excuse me. Uh, I turned off the camera because I think, um, I don't wanna run out of the bandwidth. You can see me for a few seconds, but I will yes. turn it off again if, because I think what is important is the presentation itself, but. Um, anyway, it's so, fine. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, the yeah. internet is good. It looks fine. Okay, okay. okay. very good. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be talking about the National Observatory Project. I'd like to thank the organizers for the uh, invitation and giving us the opportunity to, to talk about the National Observatory Project. And I'd like to also extend my uh, appreciation to my colleagues at the ENO and IPN, and those that have been named here, and what there are a lot more people that 
are working with us at the present and also the colleagues who used to be working with us in the past. Um, oops, okay, right. So let me begin by presenting this view graph in which I describe the development of telescope, uh, telescopes uh, to this moment, um, pretty much uh, by their mirror size, uh, except for the extremely large facilities such as TMT, ELT, and GMT, which are being developed. Uh, what this view graph shows... Sorry, that... if, you are, if you are sharing any uh, videos, we are not seeing them. Uh, no, I think you can see that. Uh, is it for everyone or can somebody see it? I can see your slides. I think there is a yes. horizontal bar. Let me turn off my video because some people would, would, would see my video. Do, do you see the presentation now? I'm not seeing them. Um, so I have I think, your I, I have your presentation. I think I the think. screen you have. I think um, uh, what do I do? Well, if if a lot of people see it, so then in probably yeah, uh, yeah that is what we have your screen. Okay, yes, so we can see all. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, if if you don't mind, I will continue. Okay. But I, I don't see your slides either. Um, right. Well, I think it must be something to do with the window that yes. you are using. I think you should minimize the list of participants yes. and allow for the presentation to be seen. Uh, Dr. Professor Shahi, I suggest uh, to somebody uh, don't have your screen to leave to lift the. Uh, Meeting and back again. If the problem may be, I will. I will. What What I can do is I can stop sharing and restart sharing. Hopefully, that will help some people. Okay. So I stopped the sharing, and now I'm beginning to share my window. That's it. There we go. I hope you see it. Now we have your screen. Off the screen at the top of your window. There is a there is a screen which you know you can select my screen. Okay, I'm going to be losing time. So Rob, can I continue? Okay, let's go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, what this graph shows is the race for four meter class telescope continues, but there is an appetite shift towards Asia over the past uh, 10, 20 years for various reasons, but regardless of that geography, there is a still a strong case for the new and modern four meter telescopes. Um, one recent one which is uh, coming up is the DAG and the ENO, uh, and there might be actually more that is coming uh, later, and this will be extremely useful for uh, transient observation that could be the new full four meter telescope. So, um, four meter telescopes are efficient facilities taking into account the science drivers and also the ease of manufacturing and operation costs and so on. One country can handle it. A lot of large facilities should be handled uh, uh, multinationally. Uh, and, and of course, these kind of telescopes are also seen as platforms to advance industry and technology within a country. Medium class telescopes can be used for follow up observations, especially like uh, transient sources, which is going to be featuring in this meeting concerning especially the GRVs, and as well as they can be used for surveys. In fact, the only ground based facility which matches the popularity of the uh, space telescope is the Sloan telescope, which is a two meter class telescope. Um, the ENO is only is the only significant investment, not only in astronomy in these years, but also in the across the basic sciences in recent years. Okay, um, just to refresh your mind, we are located uh, here uh, in Western Asia. Uh, there is a large density of uh, small and large facilities here in the Palma, then in uh, Kit Peak and then also in Mauna Kea. I'm skipping the southern hemisphere for, for the reasons that uh, will become 
see much of it, but ESO is pretty much active there. Um, and there are also facilities in Australia, which is not showing up in this uh, map. Uh, as you see, we don't see a lot of uh, modern observatories at uh, the medium uh, size, but uh, Iranian 3.4 meters coming up and the Turkish 4 meters coming up. And a few years ago, we had the Aries Indian 3.6 meter and the Chinese on the most facility. Um, so the, the site selection campaign in Iran uh, went across the country around the central des desert, uh, led by uh, Professor Nasiri uh, and his colleagues, a very, very uh, heavy campaign, it took a long time, and it was also led by the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, when Professor, Professor Subuti was in charge, actually. Um, so they surveyed the country and they came up with four prime positions. They took it for long-term monitoring of the scene and eventually they came up with uh, Gargesh. I'm um, skipping the long story here. And as you see, we, we expect over 200 uh, uh, clear nights, uh, 230 or something, um, which is pretty good. Actually, it's one of the best uh, in, in, in the region. Um, so uh, we have high mountains, dry weather, and clear sky, um, so which is which is an advantage for optical observations. Um, the project is run by IPN, where I'm speaking uh, from right now, um, and uh, is of course the IPN is is one of the leading institutes for research in fundamental sciences in, in the country. One thing I would like to draw your attention to uh, is this uh, pretty much a gap in the longitude, uh, which is which is a cumbersome for transient observation, as we are hoping that we will cover some of the gap um, uh, due to this. So just to put this talk in the context, here we have I provide two examples of how these observations are conducted. As mentioned by uh, Professor Feeney, uh, satellites like SWIFT would monitor the, the entire sky, would report back the position of uh, events like GRBs to ground-based facilities and uh, telescopes like, at the moment, Liverpool, Folks telescopes, and other many other telescopes can actually um, point at these events and we start observing the afterglows. These are quite important. The challenge is basically to, to ca capture this afterglows as soon as possible. And this is a big challenge. That's why they go towards robotic telescopes. Our telescope is not going to be robotic, but as I will describe uh, later, it has the facilities that allows fast switch uh, of the instruments so it can, in principle, respond. Similarly, these days we are uh, we've seen the gravitational waves alerts. And again, this is a view graph uh, from a, a Japanese collaboration I, uh, I took uh, from Moito. Uh, so it, 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 what it shows is that similar to the GRB events, all the other facilities, ground base, medium or large, will point at even this very small telescopes. Even there, there has been 0.6 meter telescope looking at these events and will try to get as much as they can over that precious time out of that gravitational waves events. So uh, this therefore, uh, what, what we would like to call here is to call for invitation to other observatories to make their decommissioned instruments available to ENO as a visiting instrument because our telescope can actually hold up to three instruments at a time. And with a click of a button, it can switch between these instruments, which is something uh, to remember. But these telescopes are not just used for transient events. You can do a lot of uh, other things uh, in galactic astronomy or extragalactic astronomy. And, um, and, and this can be like exoplanets, uh, depending on what instruments you put in, microlensing events. Um, the stars, all sorts of studies of the stars, solar system, planetary studies. But I think there is a tendency in, within our community to, to basically do extragalactic astronomy. And of course, galaxies feature all sorts of properties of galaxies feature in that kind of uh, 
uh, research from dwarfs to giants, morphology, star formation, kinematics, depending on really what sort of instrument you plan to put on the, on the telescope. So, so really, it's not the telescope that is the limit. It is really the imagination of people. So four meters can still be very, very useful. Um, and the, the, the operation mode, just a bit on operation, because we, we, we always get questions about this. How are we going to operate this telescope, which I haven't yet described to you, but I will do in a moment. Uh, so we will have regular observing time uh, as in classical mode, like visiting mode, service mode, and we will have large survey programs hopefully developed with our international collaborators and, and of course the target of opportunity or guarantee time. Or the, but, but we will try to adapt the conditional open sky policy. And that means we will allocate time to the best received proposal, regardless of where it's coming from. Um, but there might be a condition on this, and that is that the proposal or the observation has to help our Iranian community by engaging students and staff. So if you are happy to share your science program with us, then, then you're welcome to, to join this project. Okay, now back to the, back to the, the project itself. Um, the, the, the project was initiated around 2000 and up to about 2008, the main activity, the field activity was the site selection. It was a bit slow in, in other aspects like uh, approval and setup of the, the project team. This is where the project was handed over to IPM. And then we had a, a relatively quick concept development, but then we had a um, uh, rather slow detailed design period, which we compensated with the fast, with the fast construction phase. And now we are at this stage of uh, installation. Well, installation is pretty much done, but except some elements which I will describe later. So, and, and I'd like to attract your attention to one fact that we don't have an existing observatory. And here you have to distinguish between the telescope and the observatory. So when we say Kitbik Observatory, that means the infrastructure is ready, electricity is there, and you just need a space to put, a, put your telescope in. Whereas in our case, we didn't have any of this. So we had to build the road, we had to do, uh, we have to still do the electricity, we have to do all sorts of infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the, 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 the major difference between this development and the ongoing development across the world, including, for example, TMT or, or for example, ELT. ELT is different because it's in a different peak anyway. So, okay. The site properties. Um, so all we have is the, the main site property really was the scene measurement, which was done extensively. And then we also, we had two sites to compare with at the end. And finally we settled on Mount Gargish, uh, which is, um, you know, which has this better seeing of the two. And the seeing is pretty much stable across the year, and uh, we, we have compared the seeing measurements between almost now and about 10 years ago, and that hasn't changed, which is a good news uh, for us. It, it has a good um, wind speed distribution and a, and a wind direction, and uh, ob obviously this looks one of the best mm -hmm. sites. Um, um, so just a short video on how things were measured at the time, just so I want to show you some, some of the existing facilities, okay? Right, the, the telescope is a, a Ritchie curtain in optical configuration. It covers uh, pretty much all the wavelength range from three to five to 2,500 nanometers. That is the optical visible near infrared. And it has a diameter of 3.4 meter. It has a uh, F ratio of 1.5, which makes the telescope quite compact. It's in fact one of the co most compact telescopes, so it has a short tube, and that 
helps with the field of view and also it helps mechanically for the telescope to be very stable. Yet, we get a F11, which is a classic for this kind of uh, telescope for high, for high resolution imaging. Uh, it's an Altas mount, as you see, about 11 meter diameter, seven meter. Uh, it has a tracking accuracy of around 0.2 arc second. These are the specification sets. And, um, and it offers a uh, field of view, two types of field of view, one eight arc minutes and one 20 arc minutes. And it's about 90 tons in weight. So here is more detailed specification and I will just present it to you, but I will only say that this telescope axes move around with the speed of uh, three degrees per second. So it's not a fast telescope but it's still quite reasonable um, in acceleration and speed. Um, then it's the, the secondary mirror is supported by a hexapod, which I will mention. Uh, and then the primary mirror is uh, actively supported here. I will describe it in this a little bit. And this is the configuration I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, which is these uh, three instruments, or even more, can be mounted on the adapter. Uh, heavy instruments, low weight, uh, uh, lighter instruments, um, which which can cover eight arc minutes field of view and the twenty arc minutes field of view. Now, all the mechanical design, basically the entire design, was conducted by our team at IPM. This included heavy like analysis of structure model, seismic, thermal, and the end-to-end -end plant model, which is, a, which is a nice development, actually. And uh, we learned quite a lot uh, from this experience. IPM is known for theoretical studies, but it has been engaged in such an activity. So here is the, uh, some mechanical parts from the base to the fork body, uh, to the Altas, uh, altitude simulator to, to, to check the, uh, the function of the mirror cell, folks, and also uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the main gear, the azimuth gear, which was built locally. All, the, all these um, facilities were, in fact, uh, built, all the equipments were built locally, so we have not imported any of the basically the metal uh, elements or developed locally. This is the, the hydrostatic bearing which makes the telescope to be to be weightless basically. It lifts up the telescope to reduce the uh, friction so you can turn the telescope with, with a push of a finger basically and this is the mechanism that does that. Okay so and all the control system was also developed by they are engineers, all the piping, and, and these are done by the contractor. Uh, but all the control system was developed here at, at IPM. Um, similarly, the, the software for the, or the control system software, from low level to high level, a low level means like driving the motors, for example, and the high level means the astronomer sitting behind the computer and actually asking the telescope to move from one point to another or control the uh, to control the instruments. Everything was done, was done locally. Here's a view of uh, the early version of the software. So astronomers can basically grab the image, control, they can have a view of the telescope where it is pointing, they can get the sense of what the wind speed is, which shutter or louver is open or which one is closed or get some alerts on how the telescope is in fact functioning. Interlock system, which is another control system. This looks after the telescope and personal safety. Um, so what it does is that it prevents the telescope or the, or the operator to do something stupid with the telescope or with other people working at the site. So it controls almost everything at the site in the buildings, uh, so that uh, nothing, the equipment or people are not harmed, basically. The telescope was assembled in January 2021, so last winter, 
And uh, here is the view at the factory. Um, and I will show you just the uh, a small clip which shows how the telescope functioned uh, within the factory. This was part of the factory assembly test, which concerned only the movements of all the moving parts from motors, from Altas drives, from mirror cover, and various other parts, which has been done successfully. Going, going back to one of the key uh, elements of the uh, telescope is the mirror. The primary mirror is now ready. Uh, it's a Zerodur uh, lank from short photons, uh, 3.4 meter, 18 centimeter in thickness. So it's not really very thick, but we hope that it's controllable. It has a 70 centimeter hole to allow for the, uh, the light to pass through and get focused at the back end. And it has been polished to two nanometer RMS, which is the, one of the best polishing. It's, it's the, the range you use for testing the X-ray mirrors, actually. So it's, uh, it's, that's nice. And this telescope basically sits, the, the, the mirror, sorry, this sits on this 60 actuators which have been built. Uh, and these actuators would actually control the shape of this mirror so that we get the best spot um, uh, in the Shakartman sensor. This is the waveform sensor and by, by, by measuring the, the shape of the star, the pattern, we would know what sort of aberration the telescope is suffering from and then use these actuators to actually uh, change that aberration and correct that aberration. Um, similarly, the secondary mirror is also a uh, Zerodur glass. Uh, this is much less in weight um, and it is supported by a hexapod and that hexapod is able to move the um, uh, mirror by about one, by, by at least one uh, micron in linear direction and one arc second when it comes to the tip tilt. So this is the best you can basically get in the market. Um, oh, when the light is focused, it has to pass through an adapter and the adapter is, has also been built. So if you remember, I showed you the spots from a, a shock Hartman sensor. This is the real image. So the shock Hartman sensor is actually working. This is the adapter, which is again lo locally developed. Uh, and this adapter uh, not only holds the instruments through these interfaces, but also guides the telescope. So the, it has the auto guider unit, and it also does the away from sensing to also drive the hexapod and also the active system. So I've been talking about 20 minutes now. Um, so I will move forward to, forward to, to the dome. Uh, here is a short description of the dome. Um, the microthermal measurements that we have carried out in early days, about 10 years ago, has given us the indication that the, the best place to put the primary mirror is somewhere between 11 meters above the uh, site surface up to about 15 meters. So it does, nothing changes between these two. So we took the middle of that, which is, which is feasible to do. About that is not feasible. Lower than that, we avoid it. Um, so the mirror sits at about 13 meters about the ground. This is one of the tallest in the world actually these days um, because people have over time realized that it's not the, just the height that matters. It's, there are other things that uh, affects the quality of the telescope. And one thing that affects the quality of the images is what is called the mirror scene. And for mirror scene, what you basically do is that you try to keep the primary mirror in a temperature that is uh, colder or about the temperature of the nighttime uh, outside the dome. Um, here are the, the cooling system sits here. Uh, and also there are lots of windows and louvers so that the wind can pass through for laminar flow. There are two floors here for 
equipment and so on. So where are these going to be placed? So it's already placed here at, at, on Mount Gargish, uh, as I said, 3,600 meters about the ground. And here is the, uh, basically the site, the, the, the support building, uh, which supports the entire observatory. This is the site monitoring station, and we are hoping to have the other facilities here moved here. We have a space of them for a one meter telescope, and also we have the lens array system, which I will show you later on. Uh, a lot of work was done here on building the road, and, and it's, a, it's a very tough site in terms of construction because of the structure of the site. Here is just the um, time lapse of how this was developed. While I'm talking to you, you can actually watch this. This is stopped for a reason. I don't know why, but let me just fast forward it. Uh, I hope you see it well. But um, this is like 2018, 19. Um, and this is, let me just fast forward it so that we can save time. As you see, we have been working extremely fast. Um, and I'm just going to run through this. We're getting to the good side of this. Okay, so let's move this a little bit forward. Okay. And this is the installation of the dome and installation of the cladding of the dome. That's it. So here is the, uh, here is the finished uh, uh, product. The, the telescope has now been assembled inside the dome. Uh, all the mechanisms have been tested and they are functioning as they should. Um, and I'll just move a little bit more forward to show you the, uh, some of the latest uh, movies and things. This is, this is the summer last year, and this is the summer this year. So uh, very fast and very quick development when it came to the operation, to the installation. Okay, I move forward again. Uh, one uh, pretty picture. Uh, of the Milky Way and the telescope and the dome installed. And one daytime picture, one view of the telescope inside the dome. So the, the current status of the project is that we are, we are basically finishing the, what is called the engineering first flight. And what this means is that we are uh, checking the uh, quality of the pointing and the tracking of the telescope. Uh, what this really means is that we are installing a small telescope on our mount and asking the telescope to point at particular objects. And this is quite stable. We have got this this far. It's it, it's an easy job to bring this here. This is. And, and, and no matter how many objects you ask, they all sit in here. This is very good development. All the control system and all the checkups have been developed locally. So we concluded our um, uh, first light, for engineering first light, and the telescope is ready to go until next year when the mirror is going to be installed. So what I have to mention that the back end of the telescope, which is this part, is in Tehran now. Uh, we are waiting for the mirrors to be coated. Um, the primary and secondary are wait, awaits coating. And these will be shipped to the site next year for a final integration. And this brings me to the point where I'd like to bring up the instrumentation plan. Um, the, we are going to be starting with a commissioning camera uh, and then we will move on to the phase two instruments would be lightweight instruments, um, four meter, uh, four, four argument uh, field of view to start with and the low to medium resolution, again, a uh, small uh, state spectrogram. But these instruments, which are easier to develop, will be used for the target of opportunity observations in the future. When our phase C instruments, uh, wait, wait, sorry, wait, three instruments uh, come 
which will be a wide field uh, imaging camera sitting here, taking advantage of this uh, generous 20 arc minutes field, and the multi-object spectrograph and the IFU spectrograph, which also can be fed uh, either from the main Cassegrain focus or the broken Cassegrain focus. The way we see this development of this instrument is that we are looking for a gap in the existing instruments. First of all, we, are, we invite all the decommissioned instruments which fit the, um, field of, the right field of view and the F-ratio to be used here if somebody is, has, developed, has decommissioned an instrument from any similar instrument. But we're also looking for a gap. Uh, if you look at this um, data plot, which, which basically these are the cameras that have been used on four meter telescopes in, in Europe, basically, uh, in La Palma, for example. And, uh, and, and Eno will cover this part, which is, which, which is quite good. I mean, we know that instruments come and go, but what we initially planned when we were starting this project is that we will try to be complementary um, to the other uh, observing facilities uh, in Europe, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, and this is what we're going to be doing. My final slide concerns the lens array system, which is already operational. We had the first light of this instrument uh, back in 2018. And the aim of the, the, the first proposal that we are focusing on is to uh, basically do low surface brightness objects, observe these faint galaxies or galaxies, dwarf galaxies at the halo of larger systems. And one um, uh, paper, well, a uh, conference paper which came out very recently is the one, uh, the, uh, the ultra faint imaging of M33 in which we reach a uh, uh, 30 magnitude per arc second square with, uh, with long exposures, of course. You have, to do, you have to be very patient with the system. And we wait, I think, about 30 hours or so in order to, to reach that kind of uh, depth in the sky, which matches the space telescope uh, depth when it comes to the surveys. So I think I just stop here. I think I'm about to speak in about 32 minutes now. So my time to stop, so Rob. Thanks so much, uh, Habib. Uh, very interesting uh, talk and updating uh, the status of telescope of uh, Eno. Uh, we have a few minutes time for uh, questions. Can I ask so one? I now, now you can you can switch on your camera, Habib. Okay. May, okay. Can I ask so, you a question? Yes, please. please. Hello. Yes, or, please go uh, ahead. Uh, a few months back, uh, there was a ceremony in the Gargash Mountain, and there you announced that you will have the first light in uh, one year. And yes. two months later, I reported in my talk that, you, that uh, you know will have the, its first light in 10 months. Yes. Is that correct? It is, all, yeah, it is pretty much correct, yes. So, well, as you realize, it's, we cannot for sure say when this is going to happen. No telescope actually says that it all give approximate date. What will the happen order of is, magnitude of the time, yeah, 10 months, right. one year is, is correct? Well, 10 months and one year is the same in, the, in my order of magnitude, but yes, both are correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, any question? Hello, uh, do you have my voice? I have a question if there is time. Can you please introduce yourself? Um, I'm Farangis Taktehan from KNT University. Okay. Okay. Um, I was wondering if there is any project that um, some people like me as bachelor uh, students can cooperate. Yes, so, so what will happen is that the way this usually these professional observatories work is that 
usually we expect uh, observing proposals from professional astronomers. Uh, in fact, we expect well, we can, the, the proposal can come from anyone. But in order to write a competitive proposal, you have to be able to study the literature. Usually professors or postdocs can write, if trained, they can write good proposals. And BSc students, undergraduate students, often join their professors uh, in order to do these kind of observations. What we will assist and what we will do is that we will help the students to come to Gargish and do the observations themselves. So this is part of our project to be able to train people. Um, so although in the world, a lot of telescopes are moving towards survey um, observations and they try to minimize the visit to the site. On the contrary, we want more visits to our site. So as soon as the, the, the project enters the scientific operation mode, we will send out the call for proposals so anyone can write a proposal, we will, they will be evaluated by experts in the field. And if they are given the time, we will support the students or staff to come to the observatory for observations. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Habib. Uh, I think uh, the time is over now. And if you have more questions, please uh, send a message to uh, Dr. Uh, Hosro Shahi and uh, we keep contact with him about the telescope. And uh, let's uh, thank again, Habib. Uh, excellent. So, uh, thank you. So, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Lee Espitler from Australia. He will talk about the Hudson Telescope. Um, please, uh, Professor Spittler, we have your slides now. Great, and you can hear me now, okay? It's loading, it's loading now. Okay, we have it now, okay. Great, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to give a talk at this workshop. Um, it's um, quite an honor to uh, share a bit about the Huntsman Telescope. Um, my name is Lise Pittler. I'm based at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. It's, uh, the, there's three large universities in, in Sydney, and this is uh, one of the, uh, the youngest universities. Um, it still has about 40,000 students, so a fairly large university. So what I'll tell you about is the Huntsman Pro uh, Telescope, which is pictured in the back there. Um, I'll go over a bit about what it is uh, and uh, then describe some of the science goals and give an update on some of the, the theoretical work that we're using to tie into the, or motivate the observational uh, uh, campaign that we're doing with Huntsman. So I first want to introduce uh, my team um, and uh, just kind of acknowledge the, the work that uh, they have put into the Huntsman project. Um, it's, it's a fun team to work with, and um, there's quite a variety of interests and skills that go into this project from the instrumentation side to the software, and of course the science as well. So I don't have time to go into everything that we're up to, but um, I, I just want to say that the, the team is really the, the group that has made this happen. So Huntsman is located about a seven hour drive uh, north uh, of Sydney. It's located in a, a, right, right, inside, right next to a national park called, called the Warren Bungle Mountains at Siding Spring Observatory, where we have um, Australia's uh, four meter telescope, the Ang Anglo-Australian Telescope. Uh, the Huntsman Telescope is located, um, I think I have a pointer uh, right here um, on the mountain. Um, and it's a very beautiful location in the world. Um, it's right. Uh, kind of adjacent to the Australian proper outback where you kind of have arid desert regions. So occasionally we do get massive dust storms like the ones pictured in the view up at the top. Uh, but most of the time it's a pretty good site for observing. Um, here's a closer view of the, the dome. Um, outside you can see our, our friendly uh, Huntsman spider mascot. Uh, the multi-view lens of the, uh, the Huntsman telescope inspired us to call it the Huntsman telescope which is named after an infamous uh, large spider that's uh, spider. Right in Australia. Uh, 
Um, I'll go into the, uh, the dome here and just go straight to the, the actual setup. So what you can see here is the actual um, Huntsman uh, telephoto lens array, um, as it is um, a few months ago. Uh, what it consists of is 10 telephoto, Canon telephoto lenses on a, an automated uh, telescope mount. Um, and behind each of the lenses, we have a, a camera that I'll describe in a second, a filter wheel, uh, and each uh, lens and camera are hooked up to a computer, uh, which are pictured on the side of this thing here. So it's designed to be fully automated. Um, we, we set this going every night and it, uh, it opens the dome itself and um, observes, get, gets data for the targets that we've assigned to it. And um, in the morning, it shuts itself down and um, goes to sleep for the, during the nighttime, or during the daytime. Uh, it's inspired by a telescope called the Dragonfly Telephoto Array. Uh, which is uh, started out as a relatively small um, telephoto array, but has since grown uh, to uh, uh, 48 lenses. Um, behind in, in this photo here, you can actually see 24 of the lenses in a large array. They actually have two of these, and I believe there are plans to actually upgrade to a much larger system, even 100 of these lenses. This is located in uh, North America, and they've been operating for a few years, and they really demonstrated the kind of uh, interesting properties with the Canon lenses that allow you to do uh, new observations with low surface brightness imaging, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, of course, we've just heard about um, a, a dragonfly-inspired um, facility, the uh, Iranian National Observatory Lens Array, uh, which is uh, fully operational um, and is pictured here. Um, the, the same kind of science that was just described about this uh, lens array is the kind of things that we're main, hoping to do we are currently doing with Huntsman. So I'll briefly go into what Huntsman is constructed of, of and go through each of the, the subsystems. Um, this is kind of a view just showing you um, the different components. We have a large telephoto lens array. Uh, this costs about 10,000 US dollars. It's normally used in sports and wildlife photography um, and just really kind of high-end um, photography uh, device. Um, Behind it sits a little adapter that allows us to control the lens. Uh, we then have a filter wheel and a camera uh, that allows us to, to, you know, to collect imaging data. The, the neat thing about the project, I guess, is that, uh, that we can draw upon a lot of uh, off-the-shelf components. Um, so the amateur astronomy market has really, um, uh, there's people that have a lot of money are, and are willing to spend it. Um, which means that we can actually take advantage of the mass production of facilities or devices that are really perfect for astronomy um, uh, and, and our needs. Uh, this is a, just a view of the, the filter wheel that we have installed. Um, again, this is kind of fully automated and it allows us to uh, switch between different uh, filters, which are listed on the right-hand side. Um, um, in the middle of the night, we can even observe um, you know, different targets at different, uh, with different filters as well. The main innovation, I guess, though, are the, the camera and the, the, the lens itself. Um, I'll describe the lens in a little bit, uh, but um, the, the, the camera is uh, pretty neat as well. Um, we upgraded about a year and a half ago to from a, a more traditional um, astronomy camera from a, a CMOS, uh, sorry, a CCD-based camera to a, uh, a different technology, a CMOS uh, imaging sensor. Um, CMOS sensors, they're, they're just a slightly different way of um, capturing photons, um, but the, the, the way that they do it um, is actually um, um, really advantageous for uh, kind of movies, um, and in particular, um, making really small uh, devices like this. And so what's happened in the last five years or so is that um, smartphones and the, uh, the, the cameras that you have in them they all use these CMOS sensors. And what's happened, um, driven by the technology development in that area, CMOS sensors, which traditionally were not sensitive enough and had too much noise for astronomy low light situations, they've really caught up to CCDs and they now are just as sensitive, even uh, have better sensitivity. Um, they still have some issues that make them a, a little bit challenging to use um, on larger systems, um, but they do an excellent job and that's what we've moved our system to. With the Canon lenses, we can see about a one, uh, one by two degree patch of sky. Uh, the pixels uh, size um, is about appropriate for the scene conditions that we have on the mountain. Um, and it's, we're pretty close to the diffraction limit anyways. 
Um, so uh, this is it's a pretty good combo uh, for what we're trying to do. Um, one really neat thing about the CML sensors um, is that the exposure time you can take is much, much shorter than what you can do for um, uh, with CCDs traditionally. Uh, you can take exposures with this, this relatively uh, low cost system for uh, as short as 32 microseconds. Um, and for most astronomy applications, um, that, that's much too short because we're interested in low light situations. But we've been pondering ways to actually take advantage of this new CMOS technology and do some interesting science. Um, this is a, a, an animation. It's designed to show that there's a transient in the kind of upper left corner of this animation, probably not coming through the video. But one way, area we're looking into is actually looking at really, really fast transient astronomy. Uh, so things that are uh, changing on time scales of one second or even less than a second. Uh, the trouble with this observing mode, though, is that you get a, a really high data rates. Um, so each image is about uh, 40 megabytes, uh, and you can get about 20 frames a second. So eight hours a night with 10 cameras running at the same time, you get an impressive amount of data in a single night. So um, to enable this kind of sub-second mode of transient astronomy, uh, you, you literally can't uh, pipe the data across the, the dome. You have to put a, a, a computer behind each one of the lenses that has really relatively high-end um, computing uh, capabilities. Um, and so what we've done is actually bought a, a set of uh, uh, NVIDIA-based uh, kind of small computers. Uh, one of them is pictured here. Um, what uh, we are doing is designing algorithms, uh, maybe uh, GPU-based algorithms, that are designed to detect transient events, or um, if we're observing one target, we'll look for variations in that target and only get the data that, that we actually need and um, more or less let the rest of it, uh, you know, just dis discard it in real time. So this is a new mode that we're, we're currently exploring. Um, uh, Sari Kadi, a PhD student, is exploring this, um, uh, this new mode with Huntsman. The, the use case um, demands that we look at relatively bright sources. So the, uh, the, the first target will actually probably be Proxima Centauri, um, which is a, a, an in-dwarf star, and it's known to have uh, flares. Uh, flares, uh, just like you know, solar flares, um, are a, a lot bigger and quite a bit more active on these types of stars. Um, and because Proxima is pretty close to us, we can actually um, see it at kind of sub-second timescales and kind of do a much better job of uh, tracing out the time uh, evolution of a flaring event, um, hoping to see if there's substructures at uh, uh, durations much less than kind of typical observations, which is more like 30 seconds. So I will now shift over to the kind of main science case for the Huntsman telescope um, that motivates what we're doing. Uh, this is an image not taken with Huntsman. This no, is I don't. A, a, this is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and it nicely illustrates the kind of problem that we're trying to overcome with tr more traditional telescopes uh, used in astronomy. Um, it's a star field, so you can see quite a, quite a lot of beautiful stars. Uh, the trouble, though, is that each one of these stars has this uh, large diffraction spike, that, that cross-like structure. Um, and moreover, each of these stars actually scatter a lot of light from the core of that star um, across the, you know, literally in, in, across the entire image. Now the trouble for really faint observations, uh, low surface brightness imaging, um, is that if you're interested in this little smudge of a galaxy to the lower left, uh, you'll, uh, 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 the light from the nearby stars will actually scatter on top of that and it becomes impossible to distinguish if there's a little feature in that galaxy or if the starlight uh, from that nearby star or in fact all the stars across the image are actually uh, causing an artifact that isn't really associated with that galaxy. Uh, what's the problem? Well, it's, uh, traditional telescopes are all uh, reflective, and, and most of them have secondary mirrors. And any uh, obstruction or you know anything in the optical path as the light goes through uh, the telescope will cause the light to kind of scatter away from the source where it should be on the image or the, the camera, um, and direct light away from um, the, the source. So uh, all kind of mirror-based telescopes have this problem to some extent. Um, they, there's one way to get around this, and that's actually to do some really, really careful modeling of um, stars uh, uh, in kind of larger telescope imaging. 
This is taken with the CFHT telescope, four meter telescope. Um, and what it shows is uh, images of a relatively bright star. There's a, a galaxy of interest in the square box in the upper left, but these bright stars uh, send light across that galaxy. And so if you want to study its properties, the, the really faint parts of that galaxy, you have to do some really kind of heroic, careful modeling of the stars, uh, monitor how they change across the field of view, uh, see how they change with time, uh, take that model, subtract it from your data, and try to recover uh, the, the true underlying image. Um, it's not perfect. Um, it does a pretty good job, um, but it, it's a complication that you have to deal with. Uh, what causes it? Well, it's it's the diffraction spike from the, the primary or the secondary telescope, um, but all the kind of optical elements along the way of uh, as the, the light passes through the telescope will cause problems. So you have filters are a big problem because they're usually quite close to the, the camera. Uh, corrector lenses as well cause issues. Um, everything, literally everything along the path uh, causes it, uh, light to go away from where it should go on the, the final camera. That's why this Canon lens um, actually does a pretty good job uh, for this purpose. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, obscuration along the optical path. There's no secondary mirror, of course. The light just passes straight through the, the, the lenses to the camera at the back. Um, and if there is, and you know, any interface will cause light to go occasionally into the wrong location. But the neat thing about a, a refractive system is that light will tend to scatter away from the camera at the back. It will tend to bounce back out of the, uh, the telescope. So you minimize the effect of uh, any kind of stray light that's getting uh, caused by the optics themselves. So how does it do? How does it compare to more traditional telescopes that are used? Uh, this is an image in the back showing a bright galaxy. It's saturated in black in the upper left, on the, uh, the image on the left. Uh, I've circled in blue two uh, almost visual magnitude stars, really bright stars in terms of astronomy imaging uh, of deep uh, uh, distant galaxy targets, um, and you can see that the light is really well contained at the location of the star. Um, you can kind of model off that starlight, in fact, model the star's light from all the, the, the star stellar sources in the image to really recover the, the galaxy light or, uh, around the target of interest to look for the faintest structures around that galaxy. Uh, compared to uh, traditional t astronomy telescopes, it, it just does a whole lot better at minimizing the stray light and uh, making a much better image. So this, this is the kind of data that we're collecting. Um, uh, this is a, an NGC galaxy, spiral galaxy, and we're currently uh, undergoing a, a survey uh, looking at nearby, relatively nearby spiral galaxies um, from about five megaparsecs to 30 megaparsecs distance. Our targets are, are focused on, um, I'll describe in a second. Um, this work is headed by um, Fergus Longbottom, a PhD student. And to, to motivate this work um, a more from a theoretical perspective, I'll show you a series of um, kind of uh, uh, classic uh, in-body simulations of galaxies produced a while ago, but really nicely illustrate why this is an important area for in terms of observational uh, uh, studies of, uh, of galaxies to better understand how they grow and evolve in the nearby universe. So what I show here is an image on the left, on the right, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it shows a kind of a surface brightness limit, which is shown in, uh, on the bottom here, 28 magnitudes per arc second. On the left are um, uh, simulations. So each of the particles represents stars in a simulated galaxy. You have a disk-like galaxy, maybe like the Sombrero, ga Sombrero Galaxy, and a companion a nearby dwarf galaxy. What we can do in the simulations is step to fainter surface brightness levels. And as we go to uh, fainter and fainter levels down to uh, 40th uh, magnitudes per arc seconds, what you see, start to see around the, the galaxy is a whole lot of structure. Uh, this is, these are the uh, predicted signs of essentially this galaxy growing and assembling uh, with, with time. Uh, and each one of these tells you a bit more about what has happened in that galaxies in the past. Um, what you can do is start to look for these, these structures and start to uh, uh, better understand what's happened to the galaxy. These structures tend to last for billions of years, so it gives you insight into what has happened over the last uh, five billion years or so. And if you correlate it with the properties of the central part of the galaxy, you start to better understand how the assembly history of this galaxy has influenced its properties and 
uh, caused it to change or, or grow with time. Um, so what we're doing now is um, conducting a survey, um, and uh, this is an image that we've taken in, in kind of pink color. Overlaid on top of it is a green glow, uh, which represents the uh, neutral gas associated with this galaxy NGC 300. Uh, the gas, of course, tells you about uh, the, the wider disk, uh, the neutral gas disk, which is fueling star formation in this galaxy. What we're aiming to do by selecting uh, radio galaxies that have really sensitive radio observations from Australian uh, radio telescopes is to better understand the interface between the stellar disk and the, uh, the, the radio uh, uh, cold gas neutral disk uh, to, to better understand the, the physics of how they, they, they relate to one another. One another. Uh, and of course, to look for uh, signatures of that galaxy growing with time. Um, I'll now share a, a bit about the, some efforts related to Huntsman to better understand the, uh, I guess, uh, the, the cosmological simulations that we're ultimately going to compare to. Uh, the neat thing about cosmological simulations, of course, is they, they give you this, you know, universe in a box that allows you to simulate, you know, entire populations of galaxies and, uh, you know, tune the physics of uh, galaxy formation to better understand how they grow. The, the trouble, though, is that uh, you need to, well, I mean, you eventually need to compare to observations, um, and that's really not trivial. So on the left-hand side, I show my, my Huntsman image, and on the right, I show the output from the cosmological simulations, um, and it takes quite a bit of work to better to understand uh, how to uh, compare these two to, to actually do some, um, you know, astrophysics and constrain the, the simulations to better understand what's going on. Um, this is what uh, my student Amir is, is currently heading for the, the Huntsman project, um, and I'll share some of his uh, his results on this front. Um, to illustrate what he's doing, um, I show uh, four snapshots of simulations uh, taken uh, from the, the TNG simulation. Um, they're kind of roughly the same type of galaxy, but what changes between the four different snapshots is actually the mass resolution that was used in the simulations. So in the upper left, you have really relatively uh, uh, low mass uh, uh, particles. Um, and this uh, allows you to kind of have much uh, smaller substructure. Um, in the lower right, you have uh, more uh, kind of larger particles um, and which gives you, you know, less information about the detailed substructures uh, around these galaxies or these simulated galaxies. Um, and you can kind of already see that by eye and without uh, trying too hard, um, as you progress from the upper uh, left to uh, to the right, to the lower left, and then to the lower right, you see that these substructures, so what I'm going to draw your attention to in the upper right, they really kind of stand out. They're kind of these uh, fan-like structures. You can kind of see levels uh, kind of emanating around, outside of the, the central galaxy. These are called shells, and they're a really important signature of, uh, of a galaxy undergoing a very large merger. And so you can you can definitely see these structures in the, 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 the better mass resolution images at the top, but as you get to lower and lower uh, kind of, sorry, higher and higher particle mass, uh, that detail starts to get, uh, become less apparent. And that's really important for what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at the faintest parts of galaxies. And for that, we need to look at the faintest parts of the simulated galaxies. And so what Amir is doing is looking at the faintest part of these simulations to see what we can learn uh, and to see how we can compare them to the observations. Um, one of the first things he did is uh, kind of tested the, or quantified what we see by eye here uh, in the, the, the snapshots of the different simulations and quantified uh, the number of simulated galaxies uh, that show these structures, uh, these, these uh, shell structures that tell us whether that galaxy has gone through a recent merger. Uh, what he did is he, he looked through the, the simulated galaxies um, uh, that were simulated using different particle mass resolution. And what he found is what we kind of see by eye qualitatively um, is that indeed if you have really coarse or uh, higher mass uh, resolution, uh, that your ability to see uh, structures in the galaxies becomes less apparent. So the first kind of takeaway message is that you definitely need to use this uh, the best uh, mass resolution as possible to really see these structures and better understand if you can um, 
uh, you know, use observations to constrain the physics in these simulations. Taking this idea one step further, what, what, what he did is actually try to uh, 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 do a more analytical prediction to motivate exactly what the ideal mass resolution should be for your simulation in order to see stru substructures in a galaxy. Um, uh, he simulated a, a, a galaxy like shown on the left. It's a Cersic profile and it really faint structures. You can kind of just see these are the shells. And what he did is he generated a bunch of these shells around kind of realistic galaxies. And on the, the plot on the right on the x-axis shows the, the, the uh, size of the shells, so the radius from the center of the galaxy, how far they go out, uh, versus the, uh, the, the brightness of that, that shell. And what you can read across is if you have a telescope with a given um, surface brightness limit, uh, let's say like 30 magnitudes per arc seconds, uh, like the, uh, the INO, INO uh, uh, array that we just saw, uh, you can read across this and see which of the simulations, uh, according to the mass resolution that's given, um, uh, are going to give you useful predictions for that type of observation. So um, essentially all the simulations can reproduce nicely kind of really uh, compact <laughs> shells, but as you go out that light is really spread out and so it becomes harder and harder for that simulation for a given particle mass to actually produce that. So what it kind of says is that uh, you really need to go to low low particle masses to really start to use uh, constrain interesting uh, um, astrophysics for the kind of Huntsman observations that we are conducting uh, and other telephoto arrays. Another issue that uh, Amir has explored is the smoothing of galaxies, um, uh, simulated galaxies. So on the left hand side, we sh uh, I show a discrete uh, a simulation output. Um, and it shows the discrete particle location, and that why it that's why it gives a really kind of uh, a mottled or a, you know very uh, noisy appearance. Um, you're just seeing the, the location of the, the stellar particles in the simulation. What people typically do when they want to compare to observations is smooth that to kind of produce a more realistic distribution of starlight within the simulated galaxy, and so you get something like on the right hand side. Uh, this allows you to make uh, kind of mock or fake imaging to compare to your observations. But it allows you to do other things as well, uh, such as in the on the left-hand side here. This is an observational work that combines um, uh, uh, simulated galaxy uh, profiles. So this is radius from the center of a galaxy against the observed in the case of the black line galaxy, and the colored uh, curves show the surface brightness for the simulated galaxies. Uh, for, for simulated galaxies that have a similar halo mass of, of the galaxy that has been observed. What you can do is compare the observed uh, light profile to the, the galaxy uh, simulated galaxy light profiles and start to understand if something's discrepant or you know, if the outer parts of the galaxy, the, really the faintest parts, um, are, are, are simulated or are modeled well in the simulations. The trouble, though, is that the uh, for this kind of study to work, that they had to actually make an assumption about the, the smoothing that they conducted on the, the simulated galaxies. Otherwise, you'd get a highly discrete uh, uh, surface brightness profile in the in the galaxy observations. So what Mir has done is uh, done kind of an extensive analytical modeling of uh, galaxy profiles uh, and has introduced again the same kind of effects where you have different particle mass resolutions for your simulation. So on the right-hand side, this is a plot showing the, the radial profile of an analytical galaxy. The x-axis is the distance from that, the center. The, the y-axis is, is the stellar mass density. The black line shows the input for a, a kind of a typical galaxy profile, uh, and that's what the input profile is. Um, now, introducing kind of discrete particles uh, of the masses that are given by the colored uh, uh, lines uh, and also introducing a smoothing scheme, you find that uh, smoothing definitely causes the, the, the mass distribution of starlight uh, of stars to become uh, more discrepant from the, the true underlying profile, the black line. Uh, but also, the, the, again, the, the mass resolution is really important of the simulation. So the better the mass resolution, uh, the lower it is, the much better uh, you will be able to recover the underlying profile um, for the observations. 
So this is uh, a work in progress, and what we're doing is to try to motivate where um, uh, where we need to uh, make sure that the simulations and the observations overlap in a meaningful way, so that we can actually do proper astrophysics with our observations. So I'll just kind of conclude um, uh, that that with a, some photos of the team and what we do. Um, one of the neat things about this project is that it's a really hands-on type project and it uh, allows uh, the students in particular to learn a lot about um, astronomy, so observations, um, but also the kind of hardware software interface, the, the automation, the, the data pipelines, um, everything you need to run like an automated facility. So um, it's a lot of fun and uh, for my PhD I actually I had no idea how a telescope worked until I started this project. Um, it's kind of a shame that a lot of astronomers these days get their data uh, from without even going to the telescope, uh, and, or even if they do to go to the telescope, you just sit in front of a computer, you just click, you know, take an exposure, you don't need to know what's actually going on. Uh, with this kind of telescope and this kind of project, um, you definitely need to know what's going on. And so I've learned a lot, and I, I think my students have, have as well. Um, it's a lot of fun, so if you uh, do decide to pursue a project like this, do let me know. Um, we certainly try to help you out as much as we can. So in fact, in my concluding slide, I, I provide a link to our GitHub page, which has all our, our software that we use, so the, the automation software for the telescope, uh, as well as our data reduction pipeline. We're using the Vera Rubin Observatory software stack for the data reduction, uh, and adding in low surface brightness modules uh, which will allow us to kind of fully automate the, the data uh, analysis um, and hopefully get some science out to share with you soon. Thanks very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Professor Spittler. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, any question? Um, can I ask one question? Yes. Yeah, well, wonderful talk, Lee. Um, so we're just wondering, um, you know, how you are basically managing uh, the observation in terms of the choice of filters and long exposures. Do you do you choose to observe in one filter for some time and switch all the filters, or do you select the filters as you like during one single observation? Yeah. So for the really deep galaxy observations, um, it, as you said earlier, I believe that uh, you just need to stare at them as long as possible. So in that kind of mode, we're you know taking five to ten minute images um, uh, with all the kind of same filters, um, just to kind of build up the signal as much as you know as fast as possible. Um, I think once we kind of go through the, the first science results, we might have a more agile mode where we have half the lenses in maybe a G filter and half other half an R filter. Um, and so I think uh, that's kind of a work in progress, but at the moment we're just kind of focusing on trying to validate the results. We've had quite a few uh, commissioning issues from uh, ant attacks, lightning strikes. Uh, most recently we lost half of our cameras for some unknown, re unknown reason six months ago. So we're still kind of in the uh, commissioning phase and um, we're, we're, we're just starting to shift back to the science phase at this moment, actually. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Could I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you, could you compare the exposure that you get from one of those telephoto lenses um, yes. against what you get from the array? And uh, any more idea about how the array is actually working? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so each of the lenses is, is fully independent. So um, that means that you uh, kind of have a, a completely different optical path, a different camera, a different filter uh, that the light is passing through. Um, what that really helps us with is actually kind of mitigating the effects that I was talking about earlier. So uh, the, the stray light effect, uh, but also the, the flat fielding uncertainty, which is the you know, pixel to pixel sensitivity variations. Each camera will have its own, you know, characteristics, and those characteristics we'll try to model them, but we're never going to be perfect. And so the neat thing about having ten lenses looking at the same target is you start to cancel out the effects of any one uh, lens and your inability to 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 calibrate it. 
Um, and so in that way, you can start to better understand uh, what the differences are uh, and hopefully overcome them. Um, we, uh, two years ago, had a master's student who looked at very early data and looked at the flat field data that we got from the, the lens array and compared it from lens to lens and didn't find, uh, I mean, it, there were definitely differences, but kind of overall gross uh, optical differences. Um, and uh, at a pixel to pixel differences, we kind of just saw the characteristics of the, the, the imaging sensor. But we did kind of notice some interesting structures that start to appear once you really get deep uh, imaging, these kind of ring-like structures that we haven't yet attributed to the, the lenses uh, or something else. Um, so I think there are definitely going to be individual characteristics of each lens, but hopefully we're going to try to cancel out a much, it, it, as much as possible by just co-adding all the data across the array. Okay, thank you. So I have a, a, a brief question that, uh, are, are you using the luck imaging uh, technique to have uh, high resolution images? Yeah, I, I, I spent quite a bit of time looking into this um, last uh, summer here, winter over there, um, because I, I had the same idea. Um, for the really short exposure modes, um, and also the small aperture, that actually helps quite a bit because the turbulent cell size above the site is about five centimeters or so. So the combination of have relatively small turbulent cells um, and really fast exposures means that you can probably get some pretty uh, sharp images. Um, so I haven't yet characterized that yet, um, uh, but I think it's quite promising. And maybe what might be kind of interesting is the, the relatively large field of view and doing mucking imaging in kind of patches across the entire field of view. Uh, the trouble with the relatively small lenses, though, is that you have a lot of tip tilt effect. So each section of the image might actually kind of slightly be wandering a little bit differently compared to every other section. But if you can kind of capture the, the lucky moments of a particular section and in real time essentially do that, maybe you can start to combine them to produce a really large field of view, lucky imaging uh, image. Uh, we're kind of near the diffraction limit, though, so um, it, it's it's only going to be so lucky. Uh, so, uh, but it's definitely an exciting area that I hope to to investigate further. Thank you. So, so if there's a question, I I think we have uh, time is over now. I almost uh, so the next talk will start at the. Uh, 2050, I think, at the four minutes. So we have four minute time to, to break. Uh, so uh, Rob, uh, sorry, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, let's have uh, at least 10 minutes break. Okay, okay. So, okay. so we will come Good. back at 12.55 uh, uh, at uh, Iran 12. local time. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Spittler. Thanks again. Let's clap. And um, okay, we'll have a breaking time now. Thank you. <laughs>